New developments in artificial intelligence continue to generate headlines, along with deep fake images and videos that are causing some experts to call for a pause in the development of this technology. Is the world heading down a path of achieving general intelligence sooner than expected? And if we are, is that a good or bad thing? We'll discuss the possibility of the AI singularity on today's episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me to discuss the latest developments in AI are Jodica Singh. She is the Director of Data Science at Placemaker. Uh, Chris Tanner, he's an MIT lecturer and head of R&D at Kensho. And Nick Matei, he is the, an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Tulane University. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Just say hi. Hey, Keith. <laughs> How's it going, man? All right, good. Thanks hey, for let's having us. Let's uh, let's just jump right into the the, the discussion here. Um, there's been a lot of developments with ChatGPT, generative AI, a lot of these image uh, creation tools, getting lots and lots and lots of headlines. Um, and as I'm as I'm kind of discussing these on the show, we also get a sense of we're moving in a direction towards this concept of AI singularity, the idea that eventually artificial intelligence will reach or surpass the, the level of human intelligence out there. Um, just to start us off, uh, what, why don't we, I, I get like a general dev definition from you guys about what you guys consider the, you know, the, the, the definition of, of an AI singularity. Jodica, why don't you be, start us off? Yeah, for sure. So uh, when I think of AI singularity, it's this point in the future where uh, AI surpasses human intelligence. Now, one way to look at it is that it surpasses human intelligence in a lot of uh, you know ways, which can really benefit uh, us in mm -hmm. general. But the other way is like it develops its own conscience in the way that it's now learning on its own. It does not need human uh, input, but it's also going out of control uh, and humans are unable to capture that growth. All right. And Chris, what, you know, do you, is that the definition that you guys sort of use as well? Do you, do you tie it with the, the idea of consciousness or is it just sort of like being able to, to um, like, how do we know when, when it's surpassed human intelligence? Yeah, I would agree with that. I should also say that that in general, uh, I would say it's pretty rare for I, for me to hear folks talking about singularity. AGI is the more common thing. Okay. In some ways, one can view AGI as kind of being a precursor for, you know, before you get to singularity. Okay. Um, but yeah, I would say that both of these things are would fit my definition of singularity. You can almost view it as two axes, like how controllable or uncontrollable it is, and then just how intelligent this thing is. All right, Nick, anything else to add on that? Uh, so I, I, I didn't have a great background on sing on the definition of singularity. So I went and looked it up and did a bunch of reading you yeah. know, on my, my long flight that I had yesterday. So <laughs> I didn't realize that it's sort of the, the term and like this idea of existential risk grew out of, um, some stuff that John von Neumann, who's a very famous computer scientist sort of talked about in the 1950s. Right. So this grows out of this idea that technology is out of control. It was coming out of the Rand corporation, um, in the post-war period when we were worried about nuclear winter and things like that. So a mm -hmm. lot of these concerns, um, sort of come from the same sort of place of, you know, what happened, like technology run amok, right? And so that's why I, I kind of, um, a little, I, I don't like to use the word consciousness personally, um, but I, in terms of the fear, I guess, or the, the worry about the singularity is this idea that technology is advancing ever more rapidly and that at some point this is going to be beyond our ability to understand it and it might pose, you know, this very kind of Cold War period existential risk type idea, like it might end all of humanity. Right. Um, and, and I think that, that you know, uh, Hollywood has taken over sort of the singularity idea as well. You know, the Terminator 2, there's the whole Skynet thing and, and you know, Skynet, there was a, a one you know point in time when uh, the AI achieved uh, sentience uh, and, and boom, everything was downhill from that point. We've, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've heard a lot from Ray Kurzweil. He's, he's also said like he's been making predictions that uh, I think the latest one I saw from him was that by 2030, which is only seven years away. Way, uh, th that he believes that's when you know it will achieve this singularity. So is it, has it sort of um, got confused and, and melded with this idea of artificial general intelligence? Chris, you know, you brought up that the, that it felt that it feels like there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm basically uh, saying the same thing as what Nick was kind of implicitly yeah. saying that it's not really a term within my circles of folks to talk about singularity. AGI is the the thing that most people talk about or excited about or maybe concerned about um so what what is that yeah. what, like how do you then define artificial general intelligence versus maybe what we're seeing right now yeah 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 good question so 
basically the, the, the idea with AGI is that we know that computers have always been better than humans for at least very specific things like calculating numbers, doing arithmetic. And this is their computing machines, their right. calculators. But yeah, now we're at a place where they can uh, rival human performance on a lot of different things. So the concept of AGI is, I mean, I don't think there's no like strict definition, but from some large, large group of tasks that uh, humans just struggle to uh, be computers on, that would be, that would be AGI. Um, yeah. But we're already, you know, yeah, Jody, in some ahead. ways. Go ahead. Like, yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, a few examples would be like language translation, right? Computers mm -hmm. are able to do that so much better. Uh, medical diagnosis. Uh, and then you also, you know, have had these, you know, robots defeating, uh, you know, these chess players and go players uh, and really outperforming humans in those ways. So those would be some examples to add to Chris's point. Yeah. Does it does it seem like in order for it to get to a general intelligence points that we would need one sort of system or app that can do multiple things? Because it because I always thought that the the joke was that the computer that beats me at chess, for example, I could still beat it at go fish or or I could <laughs> you know I could still do other things better than that specific computer. Do you think it needs to we need to have like a system that can multitask or can do all of these things and that's when you would know or is it something else is is was that just too simplistic? Well, I, I think for to to jump in a little bit here the yeah. the that was one of the goals of some of the programs that you saw for Go um that DeepMind was working on was but they're all you, your second example was still a game. Right. And I think uh, Chris would sort of speak to the, the the idea of AGI is that it's it's good across lots of different tasks that aren't just games. So it's effective at driving and route planning and translating and playing chess and 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 right. right. Because I think like Jodica was saying, you know, computers are better at us in a lot of ways. Right. Computers. Uh, find routes faster than us. Computers route our packages better than, you know, we used to sit there and actually like plan where packages would go and how boats would drive. Like we don't do any of that anymore, right? Like it's all done by these scheduling algorithms that that process data much faster than humans do um, and able to process larger amounts of data. So if the question, you know, getting back to our singularity topic is yeah. like, if are the computers better at, than us at very specific tasks? And th they are, and they've been, and they're going to continue to be. Um, the idea of AGI in some sense, again, like Chris said, it's not a super well-defined term, is that you know, you've got one system that does all of these things, that recognizes people on Facebook and, and also can drive your car and also can cook you dinner, right? Um, and, and I don't personally think we're going to, we're anywhere near that, uh, <laughs> despite right. the fact that these language models might try to convince us they are, um, but that's... Uh, you know, that's the, that's the AGI concern, I guess. Yeah, I've also seen a bunch of things recently about um, there's been a there was an article last week that said someone thought that chat GPT and, and these generative AI chatbots have passed the Turing test. And then I saw another one today that said, no, it hasn't yet, but it you know, it, here's when it will sort of he, he's thinking that GPT five, uh, which is scheduled for later this year to be released, uh, that might be able to pass the Turing test. Um, I have a T-shirt. I was I forgot to bring it in, but I have a T-shirt of a robot looking over someone, a human shoulder and says, I cheated on the Turing test. Um, and I think it's a funny shirt, but whenever I wear it, no one look, no one understands what it is. They're like, what is this? Are you the robot? Or are you the human? And which is kind of funny because now no one knows, you know, the human versus but if you were the, to write that T-shirt and and human language and give it to chat GPT, would it get the joke? It's yeah. The yeah. Like, Hey, do you understand this joke? Uh, so, but like, is there, do you think that we're getting closer with that in terms of like, it, for, for those that might not understand uh, what the Turing test is, Jodica, can you, can you sort of uh, explain what the Turing test is? Yeah. Huh? I mean, it's basically a test to, uh, to give the situation to a robot uh, and uh, the judges don't really know if it's coming from a robot or a human being. And they're supposed to convince the judges or convince the panel that they are a particular human being. So really adapting to the situations and trying to pose a convincing argument such that it makes it difficult for people to understand whether it's coming from an actual human being or not. Uh, right. And, and so uh, my uh, my director here actually said that uh, Ex Machina was a great movie on AI about the Turing <laughs> test. Would you guys agree with that? I haven't seen it, yeah. unfortunately. I, I, it's, it's on my list. 
I haven't seen it either. Okay. Um, it's, it, it definitely speaks to the topic here because I think the robot goes crazy and kills a bunch of people at the end. So, oh, good. Uh, spoiler alert. Okay. Oh, jeez. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's probably like, what, 30 years old or something, 20 years old. <laughs> I think it's, it was more recent than that, I think. There's, yeah, there's, but I, mean, I have just, no idea. The, the, the dystopian robot movie, I mean, it's something bad happens. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm all right. Let's, let's go down this path a little bit too because, you know, there was this open letter that came out last week of, of Elon Musk and a bunch of other AI. Um, uh, experts that have signed, you know, saying like, "Oh, wow, this we should hold off on maybe putting a, a six month moratorium on on the research." And um, first of all, um, have you either been approached to either sign this or um, are have you signed it? As or is this more of like I, I just wanted to hear what your thoughts on this are. Have, anyone? Um, Nick, why so, don't you start? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I guess I could jump in. I, I, I did not sign it. Okay. I have not signed it. Okay. Um, I thought it was pretty, it's, it's interesting that they're getting a lot of credit for this, this letter. Um, if you, if you read the letter, it's kind of interesting. It, it cites a lot of the work of, uh, Tim Ekebrew, who's a researcher who was at Google for a long time, who, uh, was fired for publishing a paper to point out some of these issues about three or four years ago. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's been interesting that that's it specifically about large language models and about say gpt2 right so these are these ideas at least in the research community have been bumping around a little while i think the letter itself um is not specific enough for me like not to be the professor guy around here but like it talks about power it doesn't define power it talks about you know research it doesn't define what that means um and i think it's these these bands are really uh on research I, I don't know it's it's it seems tough to put this genie back in the bottle i guess um i i was talking to a colleague here you know there's all of these new you know mix and match versions of these large language models that are already out there then there's more and more every day um and so the, slowing this down might be is might be a good idea but at least the letter itself without any sort of details uh just leaves a little bit to be desired in my in my opinion so that's why i sort of held off on, yeah, on signing it jodica do you have an opinion yeah. on this do you do you did you have Go ahead. Uh, I haven't signed it either. Uh, I have read it. And uh, I think some of the points that are in the letter, they make sense, right? Like the concern is the spread of uh, misinformation through these AI generated content, uh, you know, deep fakes, uh, potential misuse of uh, AI for other malicious purposes. Uh, and just the concern that the technology is developing so fast that people are not able to fully understand it yet. Uh, and, you know, so what I've seen is those in favor of uh, this uh, particularly talk about like uh, having some shared safety protocols uh, for AI systems in general that they can implement, you know, worldwide, uh, essentially, um, and how they can ensure uh, like policies, put policies in place that ensure that these AI systems uh, have a positive impact, have like manageable risks. Uh, and also give time for the society to adapt to this AI driven world. So I'm not saying like those are bad things. I think we do need some AI governance here. Uh, and uh, those are concerns, like the spread of misinformation is a big concern. I think it was 2020 when uh, the number of deep fakes out there was reported to be more than 85,000. But today, after the development of all the technology since then, it's potentially going to be in the millions, if not. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so there needs to be some regulation, but I don't know if a six month uh, moratorium really uh, does that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, but it, you know, I think the, the best part of that letter was that it did sort of raise awareness that, that, there are people that are concerned about this. Um, if it was just a bunch of people that maybe were, were known within the AI space, but were not known sort of broadly, um, then right. that might not have as, as made a big a splash. The, the other thing that concerned me is that there, it did feel like there's a lot of doom and gloom around this. It's like, yes, if we don't do this, the world will end tomorrow. And it's like, okay, well, you can't real like, that's not going to get much attention, right? Chris, did you, did you, um, <laughs> were you approached to, to, to sign it or did you look at it? Uh, yeah, I definitely yeah. looked at it. I, I was not approached. Uh, okay. I've not signed it, although I very much support the the sentiments. Um, not so much about like the doomsday, but just the the reality that these are very important, um, very important aspects that we need to reflect on within society and consider uh, reallocating resources. I'm not a policymaker. I have no idea the right. feasibility of any of these things. Um, but yeah, my 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 biggest kind of uh, concern or question marks or whatever is kind of to Nick's point that uh, 
how would this play out and what are the details? I think it's just very unrealistic, unfortunately. Like there's no easy solution for any of this. And the letter is very forward thinking as it should be. But the reality and even even some of the the, the experts within this space um, have kind of criticized it because the reality is uh, even our current situation or even six months ago, we should have been dumping more resources into uh, better, ha- you know, having better explainability, you know, helping mitigate bias and all these things. I mean, people have been saying this for, for years, uh, but the reality is that all this is a continuum and uh, we should have, we, we could have and should have been putting more emphasis on this right. a while back. Right. Well, let's talk about explainability and the, the, the bias part of it. Is that, are those the two biggest concerns that a lot of people still have about uh, this technology or, or is it something else? And now I'll let everybody sort of just jump too. in with, yeah. okay, it's, you think it's something else? I mean, it's in addition okay. to explainability and bias. Well, I mean, kind of, yeah, it's for, let's take deep fakes, for example. Of course, there are tons of bots on any social media platform, but now because the technology is getting so realistic, like what's to prevent just just incredibly massive amounts of, of bots going everywhere and it being really hard for any user to discern what is real or not. That's just one tiny example, but you yeah. get my point. Like there are multiple issues that, that people are concerned with, rightfully so. Okay, but, yeah. but what about the explainability part? Like, like again, every time someone tells, talks to me and says, explainability is important in AI, and then I go, well, can you explain that more? And then they go, <laughs> no. <laughs> like or well, we don't know what we, we don't know why some of these things are producing the the results that they are and uh, that just starts i start scratching my head i'm going well if you guys don't understand it well now you can understand why we would be concerned from a from a layman's perspective uh jonica do you have any uh, thoughts on sort of the explainability thing like how do we explain explainability better <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a very challenging one, right? Yeah. Uh, it's true, like the people who build the models are not going to be able to tell you exactly what the model is going to output for a particular input. Like we just don't know because the models are developed in a way that they are learning from these patterns that they are auto uh, understanding, auto detecting from the data. So explainability is difficult. Uh, and I think, you know, what might make people uncomfortable is that if they don't understand how something works at all uh, and then there are all these concerns about ai getting smarter uh, than humans and taking over the world yeah uh, i think it's just important for them to understand some process that goes into building a technology like that so it may not be in detail like what are large language models and what do they do it may even be that but just an understanding of you know what data is used to train this. What is the overall principle? Uh, it just it, educating people on what that is, and increasing visibility, uh, I think would help people a lot there. Yeah, Nick, do you have anything to add on that one, or I got because I got another question for you if you want. Um, no, no, no. I, th- I think explainability is a good one. Explainability mean it's like the word fairness, right? It's one of these concepts that really come to us from philosophy, from moral philosophy that have lots of different meanings. And I think that's why it's tough to really pin down. Um, a lot of times, most of the con- I, have a, I have a talk that I give sometimes in class. It's like, here's all the definition of like ethics and AI or fairness and AI that people want to talk about. And it's like 37 things. Yeah. Um, explainability to a lot of the conversations I've been having around explainability especially for these large language models are really about um, what someone from software engineering might call traceability, right? Or might call like, why is it saying, like, where did it get this thing that it's saying to me, right? So can I take an output of the system, like a sentence like, you know, the moon is made of cheese and figure out where in all the training data, like where is the sentence that it's using to justify that, right? So that's a lot of times what most folks are thinking about when they're thinking about ex- explanations within these large language models is why is this saying it? Because I think people do have some, most people that I interact with have some intuitive understanding that these things are basically reading the internet and then spitting things back out at us, right? And they want to know by explanation, like, where did you read this thing or where did this come from? You know, what is your source material for right. why you're saying this thing? Right. The reality is it's just a giant text prediction machine like the thing on your phone. And it is just there's probabilities on it. And that's what it comes from. But people want this explanation of like, where did that where did you get that? Right. Um, and that's really kind of some most of I think most of the things that people are concerned about. It's like, why are you saying this? Yeah, like, Where did I, it come from? When I figure when I get an answer from from chat GPT in terms of uh, my question of like, oh, what is this? What is this technology? 
um, about or, you know, when I type in something like, hey, explain to me zero trust security, for example, it, it scans all of the articles that are out there that have pe- of people that have already written this stuff. And, and then it waits whatever it, it assigns weights to you know, some of these answers and that's what I get back. And then I get back sources as well. I get links and things like that. But when I ask chat, well, you, you hope so. And that, that's, that's, well, yeah, well, that's, so then that's, what, that's what the, that's what it doesn't do. Right. Well, oh, so it's not doing what I think it's doing. Okay. Cause, cause right, my, right. Cause my next one would be then I, I tell it to come up with 10 fake names for my Dungeons and Dragons character. And now does that mean that it's going to these, these random name generators that are already out there on the internet and then running those, or is it just throwing out, four random names and you know i don't know it's, it, i mean in general it, it's it's designed to uh put together strings of words that are syntactically reasonable right so what i mean by that is like the sentence the one of the famous examples that gpt the chat gpt can handle now is the question did aristotle own an iphone <laughs> okay right so aristotle is clearly a historical figure the sentence aristotle did not own an iphone is probably not present on the internet Right. Because it's not a sentence that anybody bothered would to, would have bothered to write down. Right. But you and I, everybody here knows that clearly like cell phones were invented after this guy was alive. Right. So so semantically. Right. It makes no sense um, because it's, it's but it's likely because everybody owns a, a cell phone. So if you think about it as dead person own cell phone then it, it semantically makes sense to right. put those words together. Right. And it's, it's semantically very common, but it's not, it's not, it's not meaningful. Right. Um, or sorry, it's syntactically very common. <laughs> I'm getting my words mixed up. Right. Um, jet lag. Uh, and so G- chat GPT actually can handle this question. Now. So you, this was my go-to example, but if you ask it that question now, it'll work. Um, but if you find the older version, uh, GPT two won't answer that question correctly. So, Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, so I that, but but that, 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 that brings out a thing, right? These things are changing, right? Like even if you have these, I had this key example that I used for, for like two years and now I can't use it anymore. Now, now you need a new example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jodica, I mean, uh, that. <laughs> Go ahead, Jodica. Oh, I, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, just understanding these, these little like high level principles of how these models work will also enable people to know that, you know, if it's giving you a source, that may not be right. Like the information may not be accurate. Uh, so know what you want to use it for and know what you don't want to use it for. Uh, and just that knowledge will just help people use the tool better as well. Right. So that goes a little bit into explainability too. just, or I would say understanding, like people able to understand uh, how to use it, tool, what to use it for and what to expect and what to not. Yeah. And and so the other, the other question I wanted to ask the, you guys was, um, do you think that sort of AI in general and maybe some of these companies need a better job at, at sort of explaining the benefits of this? You know, we, we've attached sort of this idea of the singularity to a lot of negatives like, you know, Terminator's taking over the world, blah, 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 killer robots, etc. But I've, I've never seen really any sort of good... Um, powerful benefit statements to this is why we're doing it. We're not doing it because we want to achieve. We don't want to get to that point where we have killer robots, but we're going to keep developing it so that we do so that we get a B and C. And so, you know, I've, I've asked individuals and, and they've given me some great answers, but do you think there needs to be sort of a, Hey, this is all good. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, this will help us cure cancer or this will help us get to Mars, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Do like, you know, do you agree with that statement or, or is it just me being paranoid about like why we need a better statement about this? That was a really open-ended question, I guess. Chris, why don't you jump on on this one? <laughs> does, sure does, it need, does AI need better PR? Is that, maybe that's the, the question. I think it could. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough to answer because, because basically I think that the more obviously the more that society is informed period doesn't matter if it's good or bad like the negatives or the 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 pros of of the technology the better right the more informed we are the better but i i don't know if it's the researchers or scientists responsibility to play a large role in that that branding that 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 pr and in fact one could argue that intrinsically we already do because what we're working on, for example, let's just take machine translation. Like we're trying to say, yeah, we want to get better at providing this good to the world of translating languages from one language to another. Or somebody who's researching a slightly different area within machine learning, same exact concept. Like this is what their focus is. And like that should be evident by the work that, that, that they're doing. But then, you know, once these technologies get really good 
of course, it's just up to the wild west of what this reception is and what all gets circulated, you know, on the internet. And it's like, that's, we kind of can't control that. And I don't know whose responsibility that would be, but yeah, I guess to your point, um, it would be good to have, uh, good, reliable, trustworthy resources where people could go to see kind of the wide spectrum of the benefits and, and the cons of this technology. Yeah. 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 And I think it's almost like a resource. Like, so it's a resource. You can use it really well and you can also use it negatively. So it's, it's really about understanding that as well. Like it's, it has a lot of potential for doing really great to the society, right? For example, it's already shown uh, evidence of helping medical diagnosis really significantly. Uh, so that's a big deal. Uh, and then and even other technologies like uh, robotic vacuum cleaners, like they save uh, me time so that I can do other things. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of good that has already happened. And there's a lot of good that can, you know, happen in the future as well. Simple example, chat GPT. It's just so good at like grammar and structuring sentences. Uh, and it does surpass a lot of, uh, you know, people's skill of writing such great sentences. So, Hey, that's a great application. You know, you can use it to uh, communicate better, create more understandable documents uh, and really use it to help you in that way. Uh, but, you know, on the other side, I was just reading this article yesterday, uh, which was about how AI has also helped, uh, you know, enhance some of the negatives like uh, cyber crimes yep. and, uh, you know, trying to guess people's passwords and using ML and AI, you are able to do that also much better, uh, right? You're able to write more realistic spam uh, emails uh, and really go up with it that way as well. So I guess it's it's technology, which is amazing. And it, ha it can have a lot of great uses that come out of it. But at the same time, you know, people can use it for uh, malicious purposes. And that's where, uh, you know, I think some of that conversation of, you know, why is it scary? And do we really understand uh, the negatives that it could bring on with it? And what do we need to do to address it? You know, perhaps deep fakes is such a big problem. So should these AI technologies be watermarking any product of AI in a way that can help us, uh, you know, with that problem? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like a, a lot of such examples. Yeah, and again, we've 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 dealt with this before. I mean, the early days of the internet, you know, we all thought, "Hey, the internet is great. We're going to be able to send emails to everybody. We're going to connect with all these people." And and it was all these great things. Uh, and then uh, a lot of bad guys discovered there's a lot of bad things you can do on the internet. And then you know, stealing money <laughs> and passwords and all this other stuff. Um, it felt like any sort of technology development, we've always seen a, a list of good things that happen, but then we've also recognized that there's bad things that happen too. But like we didn't try to ban the internet when it when it came out. We there wasn't there wasn't sort of an open letter sort of you know. So this feels a little different, but it also but also we've got history on our side of like yeah we you know people stealing money is bad you know for those people that lose their money. But we we didn't shut down everything because of that. Um, I I don't know. Maybe I'm just I'm just rambling at yeah. this. Point. I don't know. If we we uh, some people tried to ban the internet. There's still plenty of people that like don't use Facebook. We're still talking about regulations That's for some point. of these yeah. communication technologies um um for, for for teens i think there's a bunch of law some laws just passed in california maybe utah um so i, I think that's the, true the you've, got all, and, the, and you've got all the tiktok stuff too going yeah. on yeah right so, exactly yeah so i i think it's i, I think your, your larger point keith is that you know these these technologies come out and there there's always a conversation about how we integrate them into society um, and who are the benefits accruing to and where are the costs, right? And that's a conversation that doesn't just happen from technologists that also needs to include communities that are affected by it. It needs to include people that have no idea what these technologies are, um, you know, and it needs to include government and policymakers and things like that. And I think these conversations do happen. They just happen very slowly, right? And that's the, you know, the it's it's a lot easier for a, for a future of life think tank to come out and, and you know, put this letter out there. It's much harder to really write rules around um, how these things get done, um, how, the, how this regulation happens. I know I've been on these uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology panels for the last three years trying to write these large policy documents like the, you know, about like how we govern different aspects of AI decision making. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's slow and it's very unsexy. Um, but coming out and saying, oh, let's ban it. 
um, you know, is, 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 a, is a quicker way. But this, it is a big conversation. Um, and the costs and benefits of any technology is, is, a, is an ongoing one. You know, it's not one that we sort of say, okay, oh, we're done with that, right? Like, you know, it's always something that it's always where the rules are changing and where the people who are being harmed or benefited, you know, change. And we need to, to revisit that conversation, right? Right. So, um, Chris, I wanted to bring this up with you because I know that when we talked uh, ahead of time, um, there was a discussion of like, where are we? If there was, if this was a curve, and you get that hockey stick sort of uh, effect in terms of where yeah, yeah, yeah. AI is at the moment, are we still at that sort of the baseline of of the hockey stick, or are we now like on that trajectory upward? Or you know, you know, if if you had to, if you had to make a guess of you know April twenty twenty three, this is where we're at mm-hmm. on the on the on the graph. Or is it yeah, is it yeah. even too hard to to do this at this point while we're going yeah, through it? Yeah, of course it's yeah, of course it's like essentially impossible to predict yeah. these things, uh, and things have been accelerating at an exponential rate. I would say for the past, I mean, like in some ways, always right. You're always on that continuum, but especially yeah. the last ten years have been absolutely nuts. Um, but if I if I had to guess, right, it's just a fun thought exercise. I would say we're we're at the early <laughs> slash mid point of the uh, the crazy. A high derivative yeah. before any plateau. Okay. Um, because yeah, because it's just so hard to um, it's so hard to to even guess what this is all going to enable. And I think like to, not to backtrack, but to, to the previous question, I, I love that analogy of comparing it to the internet. Uh, and to Nick's point, like yeah, even things like the internet took a long time. The first internet connection was in 1969, and then you know it really started to enter a lot of people's households in like the mid 90s. Yeah, but it was it was uh, it received I think slower pushback on the internet than the pushback we're starting to see with, for example, ChatGPT. I think it's because it was hard to anticipate and imagine what all the internet would afford. Whereas with ChatGPT, it was almost like a stepwise function to the public. The technology has been building. All of our researchers knew the capabilities of NLP, but all of a sudden, bam, it was like very in our face, very easy for anybody with a computer to just play with ChatGPT and see the benefits of it. And thus also, you know, the pros and the, the negatives. Okay. So, so if didn't I mean to backtrack, but no, yeah, that's okay. Like, no, because it like made me think of another. I think we're accelerating at a crazy yeah. pace right now. I, uh, does anyone else want to jump in? Like, are, are do you agree with Chris in terms of where we're at right now, or are we still really at the early days? And you know, it's going to be even crazier next year. I'm sure it will be crazier next year. Like every day, I, I see a new story. I'm going, oh my gosh! Like I can't believe I can do that now. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Chris. And uh, you know, large language models, for example, have existed for a few years. It's just this has been this first time where something like this, like Chat GPT, has been opened up to the public. And so many people are using it. And that's why, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, attention that it has been getting. But I agree with Chris. I think we are somewhere, we, we are yet to peak for sure. All right, Nick. I, you know, you asked me about this question. I still haven't really, I, I don't know, right? Because it's, it's, it, it, it's the idea of like, do you think the curve is going up or do you think there's eventually going to be sort of like diminishing returns, right? Like, is it, is it going to sort of slow down and like crest off, right? Because if have we, are we going to accelerate or are we going to slow down? And I, yeah. I honestly have no idea. So it I don't know. What, yeah, it we certainly are feels like we're accelerating <laughs> um, at the moment, g- given that, you know, the, it, this first started in December of, or November 2022. And, you know, since then it's just been nonstop right. news and nonstop sort of discovery. Right. But I mean, you could you could say the same thing about like you look at something like plane flight or the speed of cars, right? Like it was going faster and faster and faster and faster. And we got on rockets and then all of a sudden we're not really going True. that much faster as humans anymore. Right. right. So it's I, I think it's really tough to Chris's point. It's really tough to to know, you know, are we going to keep going up or are we going to plateau off? Like, I mean, it, it's 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 really tough. And I think the only constant is that it's going to keep changing. Right. And that our, our perspective tomorrow is going to be probably different than our perspective today, which um, is right. I don't know. All right. Crazy, so crazy and liberating at the same time. <laughs> that's what makes this, this topic so fun to talk about. Uh, exactly. You know, I, think right. one way, I think one way of trying to ground it would be to think about what are the big remaining things that we've barely been able to make any progress on and kind of to kind of to what you were saying earlier, Nick, uh, I forgot to, to which question, but to think of like multimodal stuff, you know, like it's so hard to mix right. video with, with language and we've been doing, you know, We've had incredible success over the last three years, but there's still so much room for improvement. And I think we're going to see some really impressive gains in the next two to three years. 
Well, well, does that you know that made me think of like, do we need an AI moonshot sort of sort of approach, maybe from? And again, I don't want to bring the government into it, but you know when, um, you know back in the '60s there was like, hey, we're going to go to the moon, and you know they had a goal, and and right. and they got there, and they landed on the moon, and that it, it galvanized everybody. It, do we need something similar in AI, or is it is it is it just that's not a big that's not an idea because we don't know exactly what the goal would be. Like, but again, so we have those, big, those big problems, right? Huh? Yeah. Chris, what? Well, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Well, I didn't mean to dominate here, but I was like, I think we already have like just millions of practitioners who are already doing moonshot approaches, which is good. I don't say this disparagingly, right? Yeah. Just so many folks in, in high school, right? Without even taking formal classes in this, like we've democratized it and we've lowered the barrier of entry. So I think people are trying outlandish things and stuff is happening progress is happening all right so so i want to and again i think I, go, oh, ahead. I wanted, go ahead i got another I question but say, go ahead. i think the um i wanted to tie it back to you talked about a moonshot i think the turing test as a as a concept which we talked about before right that was a moonshot right it's that this this you gotta remember at the time computers was this thing you ran with a crank yeah like that you like you punch some cards and you, and you turned a crank and like the idea that this thing was ever going to be able to convince someone that it was a person right that it was intelligent which is really what the Turing test is all about. It's saying, okay, well, if you don't know what intelligence is, I don't know what intelligence is, but if I can convince you I'm an intelligent thing, aka another person, then I must be doing some intelligent stuff. But the Turing test on its own could be understood as a moonshot. And that's why it's it's really been an animating concept for the field for so long um, is because, you know, in order to do all the stuff that you need to pass the Turing test, you have to, you have to you know, get over all these little challenges. Yeah. And that's why it's been such, so it's why it's captures so much imagination there, like you said, because it is a moonshot. And I think it's, you know, we maybe need to refine it a little bit, right? Because because now we're kind of at this point where it's like, okay, well, the computer can kind of convince us it's a person, sort of. Uh, and, you know, is that, you know, what's sort of the next thing? But you'll see some of these, right? There's the idea, some of these protein folding things, some of these um, uh, AI for science type ideas. Like there's a few of these in the research community, but they're not as like big and grabby, I think, as, as kind of, um, like you said, going to the moon or maybe the Turing test originally was. So yeah, maybe it's time to, to rethink a, like a, what's a new sort of cohesive one. Um, would be a good question. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that I'm, I'm a human. It's like, so I, I may be a robot <laughs> at this point. I've, there's still there's still some debate, um, especially for my family. Uh, J- Jodica, well, guess what? You you yeah. passed the Turing test. I think you. I I thought you were a human. <laughs> well, yeah. Some of my family might disagree with some of the decisions that I make. Um, Jodica, I'm going to ask you sort of a hypothetical question. I'm going to put uh, each of you. Um, you are now in charge of AI. Like we we I I made this decision because I'm emperor of the world. Okay, so I said, all right, Jodica, you are now in charge of AI development what is sort of the first thing you would do? Like, do you do anything? Do you do, you know, like where, where do you, if, if you could steer the direction of where AI goes from this point, where, what would you do? Well, that's a very difficult question. Uh, but you have the power. That's a so, very tough one. Yeah, assume that you have the power to do whatever you want. And, and so wh- where, where do you, and I'm going to ask the, uh, the uh, Nick and Chris, the same question. So I'm not putting all the pressure yeah, well, on you. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to first spend some time just thinking about everything and every aspect that I haven't already, right? Because that is like really a lot of power to have. Uh, I think AI development is has the potential to do a lot of good. But then, as mentioned earlier, right, that there there is a downside to it. There needs to be some regulation. So it would perhaps be a lot of conversations about how we can uh, develop AI as well as uh, these policies and AI governance and some regulation alongside AI development. So there's not that big gap that we already made so many advancements and now there's so many problems, but the policies and the regulation takes time to really get there. So how can we, uh, you know, do that hand in hand, like more together, more in parallel? Uh, I think that might be, you know, uh, one of the one of the concerns that I do have today. So that might be the direction that I would be think thinking okay. about. All right, Nick, I've I've now placed you in 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 charge of of AI. 
you are the man. So what's 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 the first couple of things you do? Like, do you do you go to oh, Congress man. and go, we need more policies? I mean, it feels like regulation is going to be way behind on this. But so like, what, what what's the first? I mean, yeah, you do? there's that's kind of there's a there's a it's called policy vacuum, right? Is that technology moves so fast that we have this like vacuum where there's no policies that exist? Um, that seems to be what we do in the U.S., right? That's why we still don't have like a coherent crypto policy and things like that. We yeah. sort of let things happen and then um, and then figure it out later. <laughs> and then clean up um, the mess if I was afterwards. In charge, yeah. Yeah, we clean up the mess after. It's a very American way to look at things, which I, <laughs> I kind of love. Um, some people do. Some people think it's terrible. Uh, I just got back from an overseas trip, so I have you know very different perspective than I normally would. Yeah. Um, the uh, if I'm in charge, though, if I'm king of the world, what would I do? Um, <laughs> king of AI. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you just, you know, you just upgraded I, yourself. No, 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 you, no, no. Remember, I'm emperor. Really so, oh, yeah, sorry, you, you're only king of AI, Nick. You're not. You're not. I'm. I'm the emperor of the world. Sorry, okay. sorry. <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I'm stuck at a university now. You know, so we think we're kings of everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, I really like Jodica's point about trying to. Um, uh, and this is something that we that we try to do here. You know, a lot of is is really do more community engagement with this development stuff, right? I think a lot of the the AI development. You look at Chat GPT, right? Like what it costs to train one, you know, one iteration of Chat GPT is something like four million dollars or something. They came out and sort of said it, right? So it's it's so inaccessible to so many people. Um, and I think that you know, and 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 Chris picked up on this earlier too like really democratizing these technologies and democratizing one in terms of making it available, um, you know, online, open source publications, things like that. But two, in like making sure that the communities who are going to be impacted, the communities that that maybe don't normally have access to these things do. And, and uh, that includes the knowledge, how to use them and the resources to use them. Right. And so I think really trying to push into um, those spaces is, 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 is a good way to go. I think all too often, you know, the, these, a lot of these AI developments, you know, by necessity, because they're big technology projects are really housed in these large tech companies yep. um, are really, you know, things that happen at universities with, you know, in the cloistered labs where we all think we're king of the world anyway. Um, you know, <laughs> so it's just getting out of that, right? And like really making sure that, that that's a first and foremost kind of policy and, and sort of design space um, uh, would be would be really good. OK, Chris, you're now you're now head of AI or king of AI. What? Yeah, I, I haven't thought about this before, but okay. I'm the last to go. So I've had more time to think about this yeah. than I guess anybody else here. But yeah, the way that I've always uh, kind of framed AI machine learning in general is that there are a few pillars. And this is kind of to Nick's point that some of those pillars are towards like kind of democratizing things. Some of those some of those pillars that have really allowed a lot of great innovation, especially over the last five years, are things like uh, allowing reproducibility of models. Right. Historically, I'm going to try to make this succinct, but historically, if somebody could research a model and come up with a really great model, but then nobody could reproduce it. Right? The source code isn't available or it would just be really messy and you would spend years of your life. I've spent years of my life trying to reproduce somebody else's code that I needed to compare against. So this is like one of the pillars. You know, so like Hugging Face, for example, is one company that has really kind of led this space and and has really enabled a lot of progress within machine learning because they make models available and they make data available. I'm not trying to like just advertise for certain companies here, but I'm yeah. addressing that there are certain things that have really allowed innovation to fuel. And I think we're getting to a point, this is also to, to Nick's point that, that there are a few companies that are training these very large language models. And of course we don't have to limit our conversation to just large language models, but it's a compelling example. Yeah. And and I think the the danger is that that it could shift things to just essentially being a monopoly of kind of the same way that we saw with operating systems, but at least with Linux, it was this open source operating system, and you could tinker around and make things your own. We do have some players within the space of ML who are making open source great large language models. Bloom is the best example that I know of. But that's one solution, and I think to really kind of help make sure that that um, everybody gets a fair shot and that things are as democratized as possible, maybe it would also involve things like, um, yeah, focusing on 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 like the computational power, right? Not just the organizations who can make these things available, but allow it to be possible for any group of dozens or hundreds of folks to get together. So I, I don't know how that would play out, but you know. Maybe just making GPU, it's like maybe more people competing in the GPU space, just making it easier so that it's not just 
spend four million dollars and then you can get something i don't know how to enact that i don't know how to do that i would also like to put more resources kind of to what we were talking about earlier with explainability i would love to somehow make that possible maybe dump tons of funding because it's it's not it's not glamorous to work on feasibility Uh, it's not glamorous to work on fairness and bias um everybody just wants the flashiest best performing models because that's fun um yeah. So I don't know how to invoke this change, but okay. seeing changes towards that would be good. I think. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm, we're going to bring you all back uh, at the end of the year and we're going to sort of say, <laughs> you know, we're going to probably see if like if you were still king of AI um, <laughs> uh, or, you know, that that's offensive on my end. I'm sorry, king or queen of AI. Sorry, Jodica. So, so I'm to make sure that you're the head of AI. Uh, you're in charge of mm-hmm. everything. Um, but that, you know, I also wanted to ask sort of as a final question, um, kind of getting back to the original ideas, you know, are, are we getting closer to the AI singularity? I was going to say, like, by the end of the year, do you think we'll have achieved it? But I, I'm getting a sense of, based on the definitions that we've had and talking about general intelligence, that we feel that it's pro- we're probably not going to be there by the end of the year. But do these developments get us closer? So yes or no, I guess, from, from each of the things. Are, 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 we, are we moving towards that idea of either AGI or, or a singularity? Jodica, why don't you start? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, every development is getting us closer to that idea for sure. So, yes, I think directionally, all of these developments help. Okay, Nick. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would typically agree with Jodica. I, I, yeah, all of these developments are moving us in a direction where we have sort of more technology, right? And that's functionally what the singularity is kind of postulating at the end of the day is that like there's more technology and things are going to get faster and faster okay. right so yeah these are all sort of moving us in that direction and chris yeah i mean it, I, I i agree but if you focus on the control aspect like losing control for singularity then yeah that's to be determined that all just relies on how much uh power we give the models in terms of what they have influence over but definitely in terms of agi and the capabilities yeah we're definitely making serious strides we're definitely not there but it's heading in that direction. Yeah, and I, and I guess I probably should have asked sort of a secondary question of this, like, like, are we getting there and is it a good thing? Like, do we think that we are on the right track at the moment or do we feel like that, that we're going in the wrong direction without a couple of course corrections? It, that's what I, I, I get a sense of sort of from the angst of the AI community at the moment. Yeah, Chris, I mean, <laughs> yeah go ahead. Again, a, a tricky question, right? But of course, there's good, and of course, there's uh, stuff that's not really good that's happening right now. So, uh, I guess we have a bit of both, uh, right? And uh, I do think there needs to be some corrective measures, or just again, AI governance things we need to think about. I love Chris's uh, point on you know the shareability of these models as well. Uh, not to digress too much, but. You know, every time a large language model is, uh, you know, built there, it just is associated with a lot of carbon emission as well. So there's impact on the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but just in in general, right? For example, uh, we we don't stop medical research. So anytime a new drug is developed, it goes through certain testing and safety, uh, you know, guidelines that it has to follow. Uh, before it's actually released uh, to the public for open use. Uh, Not saying that's the exact path for AI, but we definitely need to think in the direction of how we can make it more safe. Uh, So again, great stuff associated with it. Chat GPT, for example, I've heard people use it for so many, you know, really good applications that saves people time. Uh, It's amazing. Uh, But then also, uh, you know, we do need to address uh, the other side of things as well. Okay, and Nick, are are we headed on? Are we on the right track, or are we heading over that cliff <laughs> on the train? I, I on the train. I don't. I mean, I. I'm, I guess maybe I'm overly optimistic. I don't. I don't think there's a cliff, right? Like I. I don't like the this sort of this X risk. You know, the technology is going to take over, right? Like I just. I don't. I don't see how we ever get there with better language models, or you know, Jodica always talks about like what AI is doing for us. Like I just got back. Again, you know, all the routing of airplanes and, you know, getting me to work on time because it knows all the bus schedules and yeah. all this stuff. Like, I don't I don't understand how my bus scheduler is going to take over the world, um, I guess. And that's that's where I kind of come from. Like, and I don't I don't see how, you know, these, uh, as they're called sometimes stochastic parents, like are going to get better and take over the world. Right. Just because they get better at imitating human language. Um, it's, a, it's a it's a fun thing to think about. But I like I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of a 
optimistic slash naysayer in the room. It's like, I see all these benefits from technology getting smarter. And I, I guess maybe I'm driving at the cliff much faster than I should be, but. Okay. All right. And did I ask you, Chris, did you ask, did you have any final uh, thoughts on that? Like we are headed in the right direction? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I definitely think that we're heading in the right direction, but yeah. I'm cautious of our current climate of how we will use this technology. The technology itself is amazing, but yeah, you know, I don't, I don't you know, go back to my point about social media, right? Like we've already seen that it can have huge adverse negative uh, impact on society. People don't know what's real information, what's fake information. And this is just fueling the fire more and more and more. Um, so yeah, to Nick's point, like it's probably not going to be anything doomsday for train transportation, for example. Yeah. Um, but in terms of social media, you know, and whatever we hook these things up to, like our emails or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's a, it's a bit alarming. We need to be cautious, I think. But the technology, great, all for it. Thumbs all right, up. all right. So we're gonna we're gonna reconnect in about six months, and we'll 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 see how, or at the end of the year, and we'll see how uh, everyone feels about it at that point. Because um, again, the best part send, about this can is, I just send my Chat GPT representative, like, sure, just the Nick GPT, and like let it do the talking. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll we'll we'll, we'll just we'll just do that, and because I, I'm sure that by then we'll have you know voice to text to translation, and it, I'll just be able to talk to other computers, and there'll be an avatar representing you, Nick, and so um, yeah, yeah, we'll, your, your we'll personality do will be downloaded into the <laughs> internet, and we'll be all we'll be all we'll be all set there. Or that that might be a little too ambitious, <laughs> but hopefully you guys will come back onto the show. Is that is you know? Can I get yeah. you guys to say that at least at this point? Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. And, and was that too ambitious or not ambitious enough? And that's the moonshot. We need to have a deep fake of Nick by next week. <laughs> well, I all right. I could probably have a deep fake of Nick probably by the end of the year. I think we have enough audio and video of him now that we could actually create this. <laughs> And that might is, be actually That's now i'm scaring part. myself like thinking that i could do this like i'm just going to try to find tools on the internet that can do this for me <laughs> like i said like you know you you know I, it, once once the ais take over for you know podcast hosts you know then i'm doomed so yeah all right i think we're i think we're we're, we're good thank you guys uh, so much for for being on the show today and uh we will we'll catch up in uh, about six months Sounds Thank good. Thanks for having us. This was all fun. Right, sounds great. Thanks, Thank Jonas Keith. Yep. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and add any comments that you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.